people here soon. I should do this every time, honestly. Start the YouTube stream later than the Twitch stream. That way the VODs don't start with five minutes of just Harris Heller stuff. Okay. Um, we're also, we're going to be trying this format today. Because I think it's just neater. Um, I think it just looks better. I feel like you guys can see chat a lot better. Um, and then I have like all of this area to work with. Is everybody feeling okay about this situation? This looks good. Okay. I'm hyped to hear that. I always feel so cramped and like I always end up underneath of the YouTube window and stuff and I just feel bad. This is much better, I think. Um. All right. Is everybody ready for some next bow? Could I get three readies in the chat? It's on purpose, Army Charties. That's a it's a creepy background, like just like video glitches. I appreciate you looking out for me, though. That's really sweet of you. All right. Okay, here we go. Hi, the flower. Thank you so much for the follow. Appreciate you. One boy, 15 years old, shot and killed a 17-year-old. Whole bunch of alerts going off at the same time. WXLT TV, Channel 40, Sarasota, Brayton. Give me one second to look at that. Lost media is a topic that I have been enamored by for years, yet have surprisingly not formally gotten into. The thought of disturbing TV broadcasts, audio, and right VHS now. footage that have been lost to time is fascinating, and the links that people go to find them is incredible. So much dark and disturbing content has existed even before the internet, and the aim of this series is to dive into them, their search, and their stories, because, as it turns out, some of the darkest lost media out there seems to have always existed among us. OBS window was stuck on the wrong monitor. The following is a presentation of the Christian Television What's Network. My last like four of these had no frosting and this one has way too much. Us. Okay, Come and okay. join us for a half hour of fun and games at Joy Junction. Now here's Sheriff Don. The show is broadcasting on the Christian television network named Joy Junction. It's textbook public access TV set at the eponymous village and hosted by the town sheriff. Throughout the show's lifespan, the town residents would join in for educational bits about the Bible, and kids were encouraged to take part in various games. 
It seemed to have been pretty successful during its time, as it was on the air for a few years. Bizarrely, nearly every record and archive of this show ever existing have been wiped though, merely leaving us with a handful of surviving re -uploads Lost my on YouTube. spot in the pattern too, this is this sick. This has, admittedly, made it difficult I'm to so find mad. any further information about Joy Junction, aside from what we can distill from the existing footage. But that's okay, because that's not the main reason we're here anyway. Hi, everybody, what's happening? Hey, Ron, good to see you. Oh, and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting on you. Oh, I'm sorry I got tied up, Marty, but traffic was heavy and the stores were busy. You know how it is when you go shopping. One of the show's cast members was a ventriloquist by the name of Ron, and he was present in nearly every episode, joined by his doll, Marty. I'm never going to come back. Well, I did come back, didn't I? Yeah. I told you I would come back, didn't I? Um, yeah. The title yeah. of this video is have a quick Lost Media, I think. The, the title of and the, um, at least in the surviving archives, Lost Media they're on right now is Joy show. Junction. Ron's full name was Ronald Brown, and in the years following the show's eventual end, he'd launch his own puppeteering company out of Florida called Puppets Plus. On his website at puppetsplus.com, we can observe a myriad of their clients, along with the age groups that he was primarily hired for. Ages two to five and six to 11. Now, at first glance, this seems par for the course in his profession. Children's entertainment was his forte. However, it's when we back up and take a look at Ronald as a person when things begin to sour. You see, throughout the years, Ronald oh, had Moth, a I'm strange so sorry. dynamic with children. For instance, in 1998, he was pulled over for a traffic violation and was found to be in possession of boys' underwear. His excuse was that he used them for his puppets, and he was eventually let off. Other complaints came throughout the 2000s about him giving rides to kids in his church van. Unfortunately, police could never do much because there wasn't any explicit crime being committed. It was incredibly strange. Hey, Lurky McLurkleston. Oh, ew. Sort of oh, no. Where things really get nutty so though it was. is when we jump to the early 2010s in which Brown would find himself mm. caught in the a boys' underwear, I imagine. Okay. Oh, sick. We're just single crocheting around. I can't read this. There we go. It's like he heard me. Yeah, we're still on the bag. In May of 2012, a man named Michael Arnett was arrested after a sting operation. He was charged with the production of and upon searching his home and computer, they would find chat logs on Yahoo Messenger between he and a person going by the name U. E. Lime. As it turned out, Arnett would produce these images and distribute them to various others online from the username CK3666, okay. Sweet Talker Linda, and Calf Keeper 2. You'll notice that U. E. Lime was outward about their desires. They expressed interest in cannibalism, torture, sexual assault, and all of it was directed towards children, even as young as two. The catch here, though, is that Yui Lime wasn't just a random person. Sabi Broccoli, thank you so much. Online alias, That's so nice of you. Fantasy about the kids he surrounded himself with daily. Let me remind you. I don't know this if it popped up on stream. Entire career, entire life was centered around a But zombie broccoli kids. just donated. Who was That's really, really nice of you. Thank you so much. In front of thousands. To say that these chat logs were a bad look would be putting it lightly. And yes, the messages you're saying are straight out of the official case file.
After corresponding with Yahoo.com, authorities were able to track down Ronald Brown and tie his username to a profile on a necrophilia website named QDeadGuys.net. Alpha Pine, thank you so much for the 15 However, months. I can't believe it's been 15 months. I feel like it. I feel like it hasn't been that on long site, that you've been here. His bio read. I love them young. Why is dead. your name on screen? Because you fresh, were like to the, the casket too. most recent person and to a few snippets from his post history. Resub. I like the blonde boy. Until Alpha Pine him. just now, so Very it should be picks. updated. That boy looks dead. I like that one. I'd love to kill them. Yeah, it's updated it's now. It's safe to say that at this point, there was more than enough to warrant an arrest. And on July Sorry, 19th, I'm not seeing the same screen you guys are. That mission would finally become a reality. Federal marshals arrested a Largo man for possessing and conspiracy, uh, conspiring to kidnap a child. They say he was a puppeteer who performed for children in the Bay Area. News Channel H. Alana Fernandez has been following this story for us. She's joining us live tonight from Pinellas County. Well, Keith, 57-year-old Ron Brown is here in the Pinellas County Jail tonight. Federal investigators say it was his gruesome and very graphic online chat with the known... Brown's house was raided, and scattered across his home were images of pictures of kids being tied up, and Jesus even some Christ. that appeared to be dead. Furthermore, agents found CDs with much of the same material, a blow-up sex doll dressed in boys' clothes, a journal he kept about his fantasies dating back to 1978, and even books about serial killers and cannibalism. He was eventually found guilty of possession of and was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison with a lifetime of supervision thereafter. Had he lived out his full sentence, he would be out sometime in 2033. However, as of August of 2020, it's reported that he is now deceased. My heart goes out to the children who had to suffer for That's the pleasure really of this sad. monster and all of those who associated with him. For his entire life, he was calculated and knew what he was doing. His career, his church fan favors, his company parties. How's my week been? For some of the darkest Man, desires I don't imaginable. really want to talk about it. I don't want to seem like I'm like ungrateful or anything sight, for the I cool things that happened Joy to me. Junction's we went on a vacation and it ended up stressing us it out was worse. A show with a good premise and good intentions. I won't deny that. However, now bears a reputation forever stained by the devil. Hidden within them. We need to stop. We need to stop saying shit like I hope this man got the chair and stuff like that. We need to stop all together with Before the death we continue, penalty. We need to start fucking studying these people. First off, I'd like to formally so that we can prevent new these people hours. from going out into the world to do these terrible things. You know what I mean? Here, I aim to bring you guys analytical videos about smaller web series and horror video games. Currently, I have an upload about a smaller creepy web series, and I'll be dropping the next one in about five minutes from now. So if you're into that sort of thing, I welcome you with open arms. It's a big creative outlet Some people outlet are just evil, me. yeah, and we need to study fun. them and find out if why that not, happened. However, no sweat. We still got the big projects on main. Second, new merch is now available I agree, at crowdmain.com slash collection slash nextpo. We've got some super cool new designs if you're interested link in the description. Lastly, if you're interested in gaining early access to videos, script files, and work in progress cuts of upcoming projects, your support would mean the world to me over at patreon.com okay, so slash nextbo. Of course, it's never again, expected, all the way but around. always appreciated as I try to keep these videos sponsor free. Nope, this was already the second. This was already it.
1928, and a romantic disaster film about Noah's Ark hits theaters. Directed by a man named Michael Curtis, it premieres during a transitional period between silent movies and talkies, or films with actual I don't think that I have dialogue. the capacity to do this Because of this, it's today. mostly regarded as a hybrid film with long scenes being played over music. And with it comes a healthy dose of extensive criticism. Most of the backlash is due to its runtime, clocking in at a whopping 2 hours and 15 minutes long, with considerable portions containing awkward dialogue and drawn out scenes. Sitting through this movie is, to put it lightly, a considerable undertaking. Because of this, the film is pulled for revision, and the cut content. Interesting, is never Lurk. Shown again. A good portion of the cut footage came from what the movie is mostly known for today. And that's the flood scene. Yeah, I think that all, um... I just think that killing somebody for punishment is not okay. No matter how bad they are, I just think it's not okay. In it, it's just we can observe these slow actors backwards. fighting their way out of a crumbling temple and towards the Ark to stay alive. It's a grandiose set with a lot going on, and keeping in mind the time period, all the of minute this you was pulled that off with practical effects. Is less these than a person. Legitimately, you're giving submerged. away your own humanity, and you do that piece by piece until there's nothing of you left but what is equally moral as those people that you've condemned. If you want to think that you're better than somebody, Some you must consider behave the acting like you are better be than them. Pretty well done. Like I said, this scene opinion. is grand, and due to the time period, was all pulled off practically. The thing is, some Killing of these actors weren't actually acting, people. as during this scene, three actors drowned and one reportedly lost their leg. This was the result of over 600,000 gallons of water being dumped across the set, something that the film's extras were reportedly unaware of. It's been reported that, before filming commenced, Michael Curtis was warned against putting so many people in danger. However, he shrugged it off, claiming that the extras were expected to be prepared for anything and that, quote, they're just gonna have to take their chances. Let's not dogpile on Henry. Henry's the allowed his the opinion. Movie, it's rumored that you could see these deaths happen on screen with a much more fleshed out flood scene. However, since the revisions, that original version is forever considered lost. It's rumored that Curtis was in pursuit of relentless perfection. He wanted this movie to be grand and authentic, However, in this chase after... came a loss of life that did not need to happen, right. leaving Noah's Ark forever stained with it's an enduring legacy. It's fine. We are legacy. discussing. Okay. I mean, of tragedy. I'm just, I'm just reminding people that we're not dog pilers. We are discussers. I'm glad that you see it that way. Searching for a website, a window to the world, got to get online. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet. On I'm just going to have to noodle. I'm sorry. An ad was made on Craigslist. It came from an 18-year-old girl named Brooke Slocum and was but a simple request for cash. I need fifty dollars by three thirty p.m. today. I can pay you back later tonight. Hey, J. Rod, how are you? Some mess quick. It's good to see Everyone you. Everyone has bronchitis at my house, and I do not want to get sick. I'm eight months pregnant, and my lungs are all squished as is. If you could help, me and my daughter will greatly appreciate it. This post remained untouched for ten days. Thank you very much. At 10 08 p.m. on the night of July 12th, I don't think Slocum that's true. An I think from a man going by I the think name, that it was cruel hard. is why we stopped doing firing squad because host, people would get thinking? shot I'm in a bunch of places that were not instant this was kills a, to other a bunch of times that made around the same time period, and that was just their last experience as money. a living person. And According that's to her friends, it wasn't willingly. Cruel and unusual as her punishment. then boyfriend. 
25-year-old Charles Appanier would coerce her to do this while accompanying her during these meetups. Reluctant, Slocum responds 20 minutes later. Um, well, we're looking for donations if possible. Oh no, Larry. We're kind of in a tight spot and we have a baby They're supposed the to be trained. As far it, as the It doesn't matter. Goes, not, though, it, there won't be there is not help. a gun out there that is 100% accurate. There's not a single person out there that can't get spontaneous hookups. How does 120 bucks sound? I can drive you over here if you need. No, we can travel, just can't host is all. When and where would you like to meet up? I like to fuck outside in a park around 11.30. That okay? I don't want to get in trouble for indecent They want to use a firing squad. I, I should get to run around and dodge, and if I win, I get to leave with a cash prize. It's cop free. Squid game style. It's a park, but behind it, there are lots of woods. No cops at all. This last email arrived at 10:59 p.m., and as we can see, Mike's hard was keen on meeting that same night. Needless to say, Slocum ended up accepting, and their trip to Kazan Park in Wyoming, Michigan was on. Jesus Christ. Did I just forget it's how midnight. to crochet? couple arrives with Mike pulling up shortly after. Initially believing this to be another sex meetup, the two approach Mike without much concern. Sometime during the next few minutes, Brooke is grabbed, bound and shoved into the trunk of Mike's car. In haste, Charles tries to help. However, is unsuccessful, resulting in a violent altercation between the two. It's unclear how long this fight lasted. However, what is certain is that during this, Charles was violently killed. Mike drags his body near the woods, saws his head off, and covers the remains with sticks. And without so much of a single witness, he jumps in his car, and alongside Charles' head and Brooke Slocum stowed behind him, holy shit, drives off into the night. Bon appetit, Lurk. After realizing that Oppenier's car had not moved in days, bun, police began probing on his whereabouts. Appetit. When asked, his parents drummed up nothing, his work nothing. No one knew where he was, bon, but his car was really? there. And so they began searching the park on July 17th, five days after the incident with Mike's hard. Upon scouring the wooded area that lined its back end, they then discover a headless body under some brush. And it was later identified as Charles Oppenier. This is really sad. In the coming hours, it was realized that uh, Oppenier pregnant was lady in her and his girlfriend too was missing. Her boyfriend. In haste, authorities obtained a search warrant for uh, her apartment really need and money. began they searching her laptop. Prostituting the pregnant girlfriend On it, there were a myriad of conversations. However, one murdered. thread from Mike's heart <laughs> stood out among the rest. The Internet Crimes Against Children unit was called in for analysis on the real name behind the alias, and they found that this address was tied to another email which was tied to a Facebook for a man not named Mike, but Brady. Brady O'Strike. If you're gonna be a murderer, make sure you have a last name. They that has a word like strike they in it. A search warrant. There wasn't enough evidence for an arrest warrant by this point, so that was a frustrating roadblock. The hours tick by without much happening. However, around 9 p.m. on the night of July 17th, Brady would be spotted jumping into his car and leaving his home. A few moments later, he's stopped by a nearby officer. Before they could get to him, though, he takes off, leading to a grueling pursuit. Why is it single? 
lost media. Hi, babe. Eventually, he loses control and crashes into a cement barrier. As the officers pull up for apprehension, however, Hi, he pond water. on the head and falls forth to his death. Oh, a few seconds later, police approach and search his vehicle. In it was 31-year-old Brady Ostrike, dead in the front seat. And in the trunk, stuffed within a suitcase, was 18-year-old Brooke Slocum and her unborn daughter, both of whom were deceased. Upon searching Ostrike's home shortly after, they discovered a plethora of ropes, hey Marie, knives, thank you swords, so much for the follow. Cages, I apologize straps, for and bizarre my, um, writings that make little to no sense at all. Distant His toilet was an operable, demeanor, and the entire currently. place was nothing short of rancid. I, uh, I promise I'm usually much nicer and bubblier. I just am... I'm in a way tonight. I'm sorry. Most interesting of all, however, was the discovery of cameras. As it turned out, he had them all over his home so he could document but his thank actions. thank you so much for the follow. And I what you're seeing here is Ostrike as he prepares the basement he kept Slocum in for those agonizing five days. Now, there exists footage of Brady Ostrike's grueling torture of Brooke Slocum. However, you'll never see it. The police department has gone on record to say that they will never release it. However, describe it as something straight out of a nightmare. During the time Slocum was captive, and even when police were right outside the home, she was locked in handcuffs with a chain around her neck. Reportedly, Ostrike had bound her arms to the ropes hanging from the ceiling and How left her dangling while he sexually assaulted and tortured her before strangling her to death. And, uh... All of this Don't go in and was captured on film. Crochet and crime shows my two favorite things. Years oh, later, Alpha Pine, thank you so much for the hundred days. Again, I'm so sorry about the fucking... Park. It's a chilling end to really a disturbing to online this. saga and really drives home the fact that you really, really don't know who it is you're meeting with on Craigslist, dating apps, offer up, what have you, really quick until again, you actually come face to face. Time. What began as a simple request for just 50 bucks had led to the loss of three lives following a days long nightmare orchestrated by a depraved man. The torture Alpha footage Pine is, shit. as of 2022, considered indefinite lost Alpha media Pine. that may never see the light of day. However, considering what exactly it entails, I don't think we'd really want it to. So I guess the video of it is the lost media that this video is about. Coast is the one, Coast Federal. When Armstrong for Coast Federal. WXLT TV that feels like a stretch to me. I don't know. This is supposed to be a video about lost media. I, it feels like a stretch to me too, for what it's worth. But also, who am I to fucking question next, Bo? The year is 1972, and a reporter named Christine Chabuck eagerly lands a job at WXLT Channel 40 in Sarasota, Florida. Initially hired as a reporter. She was reassigned to a spot that was named Sun to the Coast Digest, Digest, and that's the way that I feel about it too, it's very 100%. Every Saturday. During her time there, she'd become attracted to a fellow reporter named George Ryan, and would seek his attention by baking him cakes and expressing a desire to hang out. When she realized that he was already romantically involved with another co-worker, however, it was detrimental to her self-image, as Christine historically had difficulty finding love. According to her family, She'd go on dates with various Hi, men throughout the years, you? however had you. trouble connecting socially with them. On top of this, by 1973, Chabuck underwent Sometimes surgery to have one of her ovaries removed. Me, that stuff says and lost. as a yeah, result, absolutely. her doctors began to pressure her, claiming that if she wasn't able to conceive within two to three years thereafter, she may never be able to. Oh. 
The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Super spy Fred Flintstone is off on the trail of the mysterious Green fun. Goose, a master of deceit. Tonight we begin with the death of a man armed with scissors. He was shot by police 24 times. Do something. Why? Get him to do something about the problem. Meantime, they say they're going to back the leaf leafleting up with a meeting this Friday with city and state officials. Good evening. More than 100 people were reported dead in a plane crash near New York's Kennedy Airport this afternoon. Mind. The plane was an Eastern Airlines 727 nearing the end. As 1974 approached, Chabuck witnessed a shift in news methodology. Christine always had a desire to pursue what she believed to be high-impact stories about issues affecting the community. However, WXLT executives were leaning more towards stories that were juicier, per se, utilizing fear and sensationalism to drive viewership, in turn generating revenue. The news she was tasked with reporting began to shift further and further towards spectacle and shock, and she frequently rallied against this to no avail. Resultingly, she became stuck in a mindset in a world that she was growing to hate. Her professional life, her personal life, everything around her. A little exhausted back home, that's exactly how I feel. Good evening, I'm Steve Newman and this is Channel 40 Weather Watch. It's going to be even cooler tonight than to, uh, tomorrow night than tonight. The reason for this, with the passage of the cold front today when we picked up some showers, skies have cleared very nicely. And, uh, as we... On the 15th of July, 1974, Christine enthusiastically entered the station. Instead of opening Suncoast Digest traditionally, however, she claimed that there was a news cache she had to read Hi, to Ethan, open it. Hi, Ethan. How are you? Something that hadn't been done hitherto. Just stopping in. Okay, have a good she day. She takes her have seat a, yeah, at the news have a nice desk. Night. And for the first eight minutes, opens her segment well. about three national news stories and a shooting that took place the day prior. Following this, a film reel of the shooting was supposed to play, but had jammed, leaving a few moments of dead air. In response, Christine apologized for the error before taking out a script she had handwritten and reading to the viewers the following. Okay. Well, this isn't lost media if we have it. This weekend, being critical of the recent rash of violence, saw one man stabbed, another assaulted, and a third shot and wounded. Sarasota police report the finding of an 18-year-old, a man by the name of David Wynn, in the parking lot of Friendly Cavern on 27th Street. Wynn had an apparent stab wound in the chest, which, according to witnesses, was inflicted by James Whitworth during a bite. Police charged Whitworth with aggravated assault when in even satisfactory condition at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. The second attempted at armed robbery in a week has involved law enforcement officers from both Sarasota and Manatee County. Last week, teenagers at the Highway like Bar and after a shootout in high speed automobile chase held a family hostage and finally were nabbed by Sarasota Sheriff's deputies. Early Sunday morning, the Beef and Bottle restaurant north of Sarasota Bradenton Airport on US-41 was the site of an attempted armed robbery and shooting. TV-40 newsman Bob Peterson was on the scene shortly after it began, and he filed this report. I'm sorry, for those of you who saw late night weekend news watch last night, we did have a film report and a commentary by Bob Peterson. Unfortunately, we had technical difficulties and cannot thank you now. However, watch this. watch tonight at 5 30, and we will have that story for you then. As of this morning, Foster, Grace Foster, who was shot in that incident, is in satisfactory condition at Citizen Memorial Hospital. In keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first. In living color, exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. At this moment, Christine drew a Smith & Wesson revolver that she had hidden in her bag, placed it behind her right ear, and fired. Wow. 
immediately falling forward onto her desk. In a frantic response, the tech directors quickly faded the broadcast to black and scrambled to play a movie thereafter. What Calls the began fuck? to flood Why in, with the viewers questioning the authenticity of what they just witnessed, with some believing that this was just a morbid joke or a prank. However, it was far from it. She was rushed to Sarasota that Hospital, and back mind. at the station, the news director, Mike Simmons, had discovered two pages of a script left behind by her. That's the so first sad. page contained what we heard Perfect. prior, however the second was a follow-up intended to be read by a third party. Today, Christine Chabuck during a live broadcast. She was rushed to Sarasota Memorial Hospital where she remains in critical condition. Surprisingly, Christine's prediction turned out to be correct. Not only because she was at that very hospital, but because she remained in critical condition for 14 hours until her eventual death. Christine's Wild. body was cremated and spread in the Gulf of Mexico, marking the end of a life full of despair. To those around her and to her loved ones, however, an agonizing void was left that would forever go unfilled. Reportedly, only one tape of this incident existed and was kept story, by Bob yeah. Nelson, the station's owner. After his death, his wife Molly would inherit it before handing it over to a law firm for good. Yeah, Bud Dwyer. As of now, yep. this is where it lies, and for the foreseeable future, may never see the light of day. That is just wild. It's very unlike a woman to do that kind of thing. Um, just devastating. Yeah, that's sad. Poor thing. We will return after these messages. Good morning. To preface this last entry, I'd like to state from the outset that the following could be absolutely nothing. The answer could be completely mundane. However, the footage in this section has personally stood out to me because of how bizarrely out of place it is and how little info there is about it. I was gonna put it in the next disturbing things. However, I think it fits better here. Let us begin. Oh, it's the 1980s. How are you doing? Beetlejuice makes its debut. Journey, Survivor, Guns N' Roses, and our favorite Rick Astley are on the airwaves. And over on a stand-up comedy show named An Evening at the Improv, a child actor turned musician named Corey Feldman is world premiering his latest track. I love Corey something Feldman. Something in your eyes. I feel so bad for him. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start the show off tonight a bit differently than usual. What I'm going to do is I'm going to world premiere my song that I just finished writing and producing with Michael Damien for my new movie, Dream a Little Dream, with Jason Robards. It's called Something in Your Eyes. I'm going to do it right now. As we can see, he had a mixed reaction from the audience. Clearly lip syncing and taking inspiration from Michael Jackson, he employs dance moves in a musical style that attempts to emulate them. Upon looking through comments about him on YouTube, it's clear that history hasn't exactly been kind to Feldman, but that's beside the point. The reason I bring this video up in the first place is because towards the song's end, Feldman's producer makes an incredibly strange cutaway to something that is very out of place for a video like this. Have a look. Okay. Uh, I just recently wa watched this? his, um... And why is it here? 
episode Nowhere in this song does Feldman the make episode any sort of, of mention Steve-O's of a podcast woman being bound to a pool him. table. And after performing a cursory scan of his other music videos, and all the people that were like in charge of him never happen again. Throughout his life, this were just seems awful, terrible out of place. perverts. And so discussion this about does this not surprise is painstakingly me. few and far between. The only mentions I could find about it were from Reddit and a few YouTube comments. However, none of them garnered much attention, and their sources are pretty much non-existent. With that being said, let's circle back to the footage so we can break it down ourselves. As we can see, the video of this woman was patched in in post-production. Unlike the other cutaways that happened prior, this one has a different border. It's in black and white and seems to be slightly lower quality than his music video. In the footage, we have a woman with brown or black hair tied up on each corner of the pool table. Is in what appears to be a small room with a swinging light above her and seems to be moving because of discomfort. To me, this footage could be one of three things. Either it's a scene from an obscure movie, a cut of a film, or it could be from a legitimate film. Personally, I believe it's one of the first two, given how obvious this cutaway is on something that's been seen by hundreds, if not thousands of people. If this were truly as sinister as it's been rumored, it would be a pretty stupid move to put it there. I mean, Regardless, this the cutaway is one of the weirdest so edits I have ever seen, yeah, and I'm still deep. struggling to drum up a reason as to why it's there really in the first smell place. The pickles in the crusty I'm curious if you know anything about this, if you've seen it before, if you've heard about it, anything. This is a weird little mystery, and this is where I'm calling for your help. Who is the woman on the table? What do you awful women want? What Katie Scoop hosting with two want? viewers. Katie Scoop, thank you so much for the Raiden host, bud. Hi guys, I'm Zero Doxy. I'm um Even apart from the internet, the I'm world sorry. is I dark. am in just like a cruddy, So many cruddy pieces mood, of media I have been like forgotten and lost a time. Right off the and bat, in I this series, I aim to document and bring those back today, to light. But I'm just kind of off. Thank you so uh, much for joining me in this first installment of I'm The Darkest Lost Media. You. I truly appreciate uh, each and every Scoop, one of you, you for taking the Thank time you so out of your day to watch my videos. And I truly apologize for the delay on this one. I had to completely rework a section due to copyright issues, so it set me back pretty badly. Nonetheless, I really hope you guys like this. I made this series with the goal of it standing toe to toe with disturbing things in terms of quality, and I'm thrilled to keep this going if yeah, you would have me. Sick. That said, if you have any like creepy suggestions for future installments for this series and even disturbing things from around the internet, feel free to shoot Katie me an Buffalo, email thank at dtfaisubmissions at gmail.com. Thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you again for watching. I'll see you on the next one. I love you all. How smell would work? It's just that your scent, like, night. you just have, like, those sensors, like, in your, uh, in your gills, I imagine. Or your mouse. Should have followed a long time ago. That's so nice. Thank you. Well, welcome. Everybody make sure that JD Buffalo feels welcome. God, this one, the first one was particularly sad. I can't believe that the police just let that girl get murdered. They just let her. They just let it happen. Um, we're going to take a quick break. I'll find another uh, short video for us to watch. Um, and by short, I mean like an hour or less, not like short, like 10 minutes or anything. Uh Died a lot in Dead by Daylight, but it was fun. Oh, man, you have a way better attitude than I do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for the KD bitties. KD Scoop cheered. Thank you kindly. Um, you have, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're taking off, you have a good one, and I understand. Um, if you're sticking around, then I'll see you in just a couple minutes. Everybody take a minute to take care of yourself. Touch your toes. Uh, if you, if you are able um grab food if you're hungry grab water if you're thirsty grab water if you're not thirsty drink more water seriously i mean it get some water okay i'll be right back kd scoop cheered
Hi guys, we're back. Um, I have decided to leave it up to you guys whether you want to do um, dreading crime and psychology, ha what happened to Libby German and Abby Williams, or um, Nexpo After Hours The Darkest Half-Life mod. Uh, either of these two are, are perfectly acceptable to me. Uh, vote yay for dreading, vote nay for more Nexpo, if you don't mind. We're tied here. Because my chat always has a way of doing that to me. Hi, Haley. How are you? It's good to see you. All right. Counting here. Yay is winning now. <laughs> okay. We will watch what happened to German. Before beginning. Abby German. Libby German and Abby Williams. Jeez Louise. Um, okay. I just have to get all my shit set up here and then we're hot to trot. Apologies for the, uh, for the wait. Also, for those of you just joining, I just want to let you know really quickly, I'm not doing the, uh, pattern that's in the bot. I just don't, like, I, my brain is not great right now. Um, I'm over warm, underslept, and, like, really just unwell mentally. I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, but I'll, I'll be getting some friend time in this weekend and hopefully getting some exercise and we're going to be hanging out with Josiah's mom. So I think that, uh, I think that this coming Monday, things will be a lot better for me and, uh, I will be fun again. I'm so sorry. Abby and Libby was in your state. Oh man. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, there's 40 of us in here. I would love to see four readies before we move forward. You're very nice to me, J-Ron. I'm going to count that month. Double negative, I hate that I did that. Oh, I love a double negative just for fun. 
interesting if you have ever come into contact with a social media profile under the name Anthony underscore shots using this person's Fuck. image right and likeness. Please second. contact the Indiana State Police or the FBI. Links to contact both are in the description box down below. This is one of the profiles under the name. And here are just a few photos that this person, who went by the name of Anthony, would use. This information is vitally important to the case we are going to be talking about today. And if you have ever spoken to this man on Instagram, Snapchat, or any other social media, you might have the key to getting justice for Libby and Abby. Contacting the authorities might seem daunting and scary, but if you have any information or spoke to this account in 2017, you could help get justice for these two girls. If you are unsure Sorry, or if this person looks familiar to you, I would implore you to check to make sure if you have ever come into contact with Anthony underscore shots now before we start the video. Normally, the content I create here can be consumed passively, but that is not the case now. Please take the time today to check. Libby and Abby are relying on you. Thank you. I like that he took a minute to try to help solve this case. I think that's lovely that he's doing that. In 2010, the documentary film Catfish was released. The film I followed a young man who had been having an online love Neve. affair with what he believed I to be the woman Neve. of his dreams. Nev, the man featured Neve. in the documentary, fell in it's love Neve. with an outstandingly beautiful woman over the internet. And through the coaxing of his brother, the documentarian, they attempt to track the woman down so she and Nev can start their relationship. However, it doesn't take long for things to go wrong and for the brothers to realize that Megan, the woman that Nev believed he was talking to romantically in planning his life around, was really Angela, a 39-year-old married mother of two severely mentally disabled children. For Angela, Pretending to be a young singer, photographer, artist, and have social media accounts as various different people was viewed as an escape. She wanted a bit of freedom from her life and a break from Wait. being a stay-at-home parent, and she utilized social media to do it. The documentary brought to light a common practice in the age of the internet, catfishing, which is Sorry, the act of presenting out. yourself as someone else online. As social media has become more and more normalized, the act of catfishing others has become so common that many casually describe making fake accounts to check if their spouse is cheating or just to make money. However, in most cases, like the one we are covering today, catfishing can be incredibly dangerous. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. We are going to be covering the case of Liberty German and Abigail Williams, a currently unsolved case that has had major breakthroughs in the last couple of years. This is a case that has been covered by a plethora of other creators. However, given the new information that has come out in the recent months, as well as the victim's family asking for more media attention, I felt that it was pertinent to discuss this case and bring it to a new audience, with the hopes that this will lead to both girls getting justice. And I will be donating a portion of the sponsorship to the Libby and Abby Park Foundation what Fund, which funds the development and maintenance of new or existing parks and when did softball I change my facilities profile picture? Probably and like programs in Delphi, ago? Indiana. Similarly, I will leave a link to donate to Give the fund take. in the description down below. If anyone is interested in donating My concept of time well. is but very now, bad. In older, well, that's not true. true. In the short term, it's awesome. Shows, there is a tried and true cliche about small town Like I'm really good at guessing what time it is, or like the entire town apart. being like, "Hey, it's been about an hour since the thing," or whatever. I'm really good at that. Have gone on but to like, say that those cliches uh, my are tired and memory untrue. for like murders dates can happen anywhere. or like how many the weeks or days or months have gone is by is really but bad. That criticism couldn't be further from the truth especially in today's Thank story. You, Delphi, Indiana that. was and still is an incredibly small and tight-knit like community. That all wibbly -wobbly. The population estimated wibbly -wobbly to be less wobbly, than 4,000 total residents in 2018. According to their currently active website, there was just enough to get by and get by happily. Everyone knew everyone else to some degree, and because of that, there was a deep sense of trust throughout the community. If something was amiss, everyone knew about it within a day or less. The community was incredibly peaceful, as the majority of the surrounding area was farmland and fields. Many men and women actively chose to move to Delphi from larger cities in order to raise their families, and the area was seen as inherently safer. Kids were allowed to run around freely, explore without abandon, and doors were almost never locked. 
with only one high school in the area that had less than 100 students in each class. Knowing each other and being surrounded by nothing but lush farmlands, the residents felt as if Delphi was the safest place to grow up and grow old. Two residents of the tiny town were 14-year-old Liberty German and 13-year-old Abigail Williams. Liberty went by the name Libby, and Abigail preferred to be called Abby, and the pair were best friends. They did almost everything together, from sports to band to photography and painting. They found that they were the perfect pair. Libby was the more outgoing of the two. If Abby wanted something or wanted to say something, Libby would often speak for her, choosing to lend her voice to her much Yo, the Midwest friend. is heaven. That kind of support the Midwest wasn't is something heaven on that Earth. she only gave to her friend. As many in her class knew her to be exceptionally kind and caring to everyone she came across. She was also an amazing baker and loved making cookies for her friends and family. Her grandmother recalled that nearly every day after school, Libby would come home and make a batch of chocolate chip cookies for the family before starting homework, and how much joy she brought to the family for doing so. Libby was curious and constantly wanted to figure things out. At just 14 years old, she had taken some science courses at Purdue University, and near weekly would change her mind about what she wanted to be when she grew up. Sometimes, she would say she wanted to be a baker or a photographer, while other times, she would state that she wanted to be a middle school teacher or a crime scene investigator. Her boundless curiosity and joy was something that affected all who knew her. And many knew that once she found what she wanted to do, nothing would stop her from achieving her goals. Though Abby was the shyer of the two girls, she was just as curious and good-natured as her best friend. She loved music and photography, taking photos of nearly everything she could in order to impress her mother, who was also a photographer. She also enjoyed making things for the less fortunate and in need, and often spent time knitting hats for newborns in the area. She was incredibly thoughtful, and like her best friend, would give meaningful gifts to others that would make their lives easier, or just to let them know how much she truly cared. The girls' personalities perfectly complemented each other, and they were inseparable. They so sounded inseparable very sweet. That when they had a Monday off from school in the beginning of 2017, it was a given that Abby would stay the night at Libby's house so they could spend their day off together. On February 12th, the girls spent their night painting in Libby's room, hanging out with her family, watching movies, and goofing off. They didn't have any set plans on what the next day held, but they hoped, somewhat tentatively, they could spend the day outside, exploring and hanging out with Liberty's older sister, Kelsey. Unfortunately, that would not come to pass. The next morning, the girls woke up around 10 a.m., and Libby's father made the girls pancakes for breakfast. Heartbreaking. They helped Libby's grandmother with some filing she needed to get done for work and started to plan their day. The early February morning was unseasonably warm, and they wanted to make the best out of it. They eventually settled on going to the Monon High Bridge Trail, which is one of the most beautiful lush places in Delphi. The trail has access to the Monon High Trail Bridge, which is an extremely old train track. The bridge itself is incredibly unsafe due to the age and lack of railing, and there are signs surrounding it stating that people should not walk across the bridge. However, those signs are regularly ignored by residents who find the bridge to be incredibly beautiful and a wonderful backdrop to photos. When the girls were discussing their plans, they initially wanted to include Libby's older sister, Kelsey, who has become one of the biggest victims advocates in the true crime space. They excitedly asked her if she would be interested in coming with them and taking pictures at the bridge. However, she had already made other plans with her boyfriend and had to work shortly thereafter. She told the girls she would be willing to drive them to the trail should someone pick them up afterwards. Gonna After speaking count. with their father, he agreed that he would pick the girls up at 3.30, and the girls excitedly told Kelsey. Kelsey brought the girls to the trail, made sure both had sweatshirts in case it got cold later, and told Libby she loved her before leaving at 1.30. Shortly after, at 2.07, Libby posted this picture of Abby onto her Snapchat showing the 13-year-old girl walking across the bridge. She also Sorry. saved this video on Snapchat of a man with his head down, walking towards the girls on the bridge. What happened after that, we do not know for sure. The girls were only supposed to be hanging out on the trail for a total of two hours, but when Libby's father hmm. arrived to pick them up, neither materialized. He waited calmly in his car for okay, a short while, fine. thinking that the girls just got carried away with their photo shoot. 
and that they were just having fun. But as time went on, and Libby didn't answer any of his calls, he began to get worried. He went out by himself on the trail. While looking for the girls, he ran into a man wearing a flannel shirt. He asked the man if he had seen Libby or Abby in the area, to which the man said no, but he had seen people down by the creek some ways. Libby's father checked where the man directed, but found no sign of the girls. Realizing something must have been wrong for the girls to be gone for so long, he called his mother, Libby's grandmother, and asked if she had heard from the girls or picked them up earlier. She informed him she hadn't. She immediately raised alarm bells and encouraged Rory, him a good to walk the kitty. trail himself. What I hate some baby boy. To get I love to you. Search. She good then kitty, called kitty. Kelsey, who was at work, I like and told dog. her what was going on. According to Kelsey, she immediately knew that something must be very wrong, as her grandmother never called her multiple times unless it was urgent, and knew not to call during work hours. She immediately left her job, Sorry, and by 4:30. She was on the trail to help look for Abby and Libby. The general mindset between the family members who had arrived to find the girls was that they had wandered off the beaten path in an effort to get cooler photos and had gotten lost or injured. The trail was incredibly old and the greenery could be tricky to navigate through. So they thought, at most, the girls would be together, slightly injured, but ultimately okay. As the night began to drop dark and the hours went on, the family grew more concerned. They had walked the majority of the trail and hoped, at the very least, their yelling would have been heard by the girls. But all they had encountered was quiet. They convened and realized they needed to get the police involved, and Libby's grandparents went to the police station to inform them of the situation. When the police were alerted, How so was the rest of Delphi, helpless and, and terrifying. turned up to help look for the girls. The community came together deep into the dark night to try and find Abby and Libby calling out into the darkness, hoping that they would get a response. As time went on, the family's hopes began to wane, but they still believed that whatever had happened to the girls had to have been an accident. Maybe they had fallen off the bridge, maybe they were seriously injured, but they had no idea what had actually befallen them. At midnight, the official search was called off until morning for safety reasons, but still, some of the members of the police department continued to search, knowing that if they got injured, at least they were professionals. The police told the families that though the situation seemed dark, the girls were probably hiding in the forest or had simply gotten injured, and there was no reason to think anything different. They told the family that it was unlikely that the girls had been harmed by another party, as there was no evidence of that occurring on or near where the girls had been, and they encouraged the family to stay positive. The next morning at 7 a.m., the entire community, as well as people from other towns and out of state, who heard about the disappearance, set out to try and find the girls. A dive team was sent to search the creek below the bridge. Drones were used to survey hard-to-get-to areas, and people were split into groups so every inch of the trail could be properly and carefully surveyed. Unfortunately, it was one of those teams that happened upon Libby's and Abby's remains. The girls' bodies were found what a bummer, around man. Noon, nice. a half mile east of the bridge. <laughs> you they guys were found at the north bank always find the Creek. worst time and for those, and it's how, actually the hilarious. Stated that their bodies were Keep me out at me, all. in a manner that was meant to shock those who found them. The police and the FBI, who have been a part of this investigation since the early days, have been incredibly tight lipped about what happened the video to of the man and their cause of death Bardic? is still unknown but according to court documents that were initially obtained by the murder sheet podcast the girls both lost a significant amount of blood from their wounds so much so the perpetrator would have gotten blood on themselves or their clothing it was also found that one item of clothing had been taken from one of the girls most likely after her death in order to commemorate the killing, there has been a lot of debate as to why the details about the yeah, girl's that video? murder yeah, okay. has been kept so private. With some thinking it's a cover up by the police. And yeah. Others positing That's what it always theories. looks like when the police However, won't hand over everything is that it, it's behind a fucking cop, aspects of this right? crime close to the That's best. what it always by feels the like every time. majority of the evidence time. and details hidden from the public, that ensures that only the people who know what occurred due to the evidence are the killer themselves and the law enforcement agencies. Meaning, should someone falsely confess to the crimes for attention, as is often the case when crimes are heavily publicized, the police can easily rule them out. This likewise helps 
with weeding out potential suspects. It at feels the same like that time, because it happens it so often. It means that you're should they wrong, be able dude. to interrogate the killer, they could press him into revealing information that he could have only known. We should also keep in mind that the manner of death, according to the police, was incredibly graphic. And given how old they were at the time, it is likely that their families do not want those details made public. The word of Abby and Libby's tragic demise spread through Delphi and shattered the town. People became scared of their neighbors, and the bridge where the girls had recorded the man walking towards them was fenced off entirely. However, the police were adamant from day one that they wouldn't rest until the person behind what had happened to Abby and Libby was in prison. On February 15th, the video of the man walking towards the girls with his head down was made public and the public was encouraged to send in tips on who they knew this man to be. Immediately, they were overwhelmed with call-ins and suggestions, all of which they spent a fair amount of time looking into. A week later, they also made a small portion of the audio from that video public. They regarded Libby as being a hero, seeing as she had the presence of mind to record the man, even when she knew she was likely in danger. The police also stated that there was another audio recording, one that has still not been made public, in which the girls talk about a guy following them on the trail, showing how keenly aware the girls were that day. Libby's father, how each of the girls could have left the other, that they could have saved themselves, but refused to let the other one be alone, and they died like soldiers. Many major news sites reported on Those the case, bringing the case to hundreds of thousands of people and thrusting it into the national spotlight. Groups online railed around the girls, wanting to find out what had happened. And unfortunately, some overzealous true crime fanatics became obsessed with the case to the point of accusing multiple innocent parties and going so far as to state that the victim's families were involved. It's at this point I want to clarify what is helpful and unhelpful in these cases. Posting videos, live streams, theories, or anything disparaging the victims or the families because you are, quote, obsessed with this online mystery because it's entertaining to you is not productive and actually hurts the investigation. Spreading misinformation because you feel like something is off with Hmm. certain people involved in the investigation is not helpful and, again, is harmful. If you think that you can solve a real life don't know crime how to yourself, feel about a true going online crime and channel, then spreading false information and then attacking people stuff in the about that sphere, when he I inserts you that his uh, opinion it. into there are plenty of games analysis like Hunt a lot or clue that would be better for what you were trying to do here there are numerous channels that talk incessantly about this case and although they do it under the guise of wanting to help they are incredibly harmful and send direct harassment. But I do to the think I do think that friends, he is, is never okay. definitely if more respectful a than a lot of true crime families, channels. Spread falsehoods about the case, harass members of the I, community, um, and believe yourself will to be never a be okay with who cares more about this case than the actual family. A lady doing Please her makeup while this is a form of watching true crime. Team. This case is very and being real like, to the people okay, bestie, so we're going to take our blush and talk about this. At least, please be aware that your actions have consequences. Like, you know what I mean? In this specific case, the man who found the bodies of Libby and Abby was deeply traumatized by the experience, but then was subjected to online harassment because Facebook groups decided that he took part in the murder. There are countless other cases where this kind of action has occurred. He does that for solved and unsolved crimes, as far as I'm aware. On July 17th, uh, now five that you months ask, after the murders, the police released this composite sketch of what they believed. Now Bridge that you Guy ask, though, like I can't be certain of that. As well it as might be only solved testimony. crimes. This sketch was widely reported on, along with the video and audio. And from I Libby's definitely, phone. I don't and want to be quick Delphi to um, images of this man up in their establishments, be saying that they hypercritical be of this dude because I love his videos Libby and, and I think that he is just but a alas, wonderful guy. The sketch itself was not the perpetrator. In fact, this sketch being released at all would come to be a matter of contention within the investigation. I'm doing As my go-to pattern, by the way, I'm making just a little dice bag. This person is not a suspect. Um, I'm going to do like just this three. Sketch of who they I'm going to make it tall. The um, was. The 2019 probably about as tall as my made finger. Three days after the murders. And based on one eyewitness testimony to a person she saw and then, um, at the bridge tail. But it had been kept private to the investigation the entire time. While the other, it's, yeah, apparently it's just going to be a, a basket circulated. 
what stitch. happened to make the first publicized sketch no longer Dice be bag. accurate and why the police now feel confident nice, that the 2019 sketch is of the man who took the girl's life is unknown but the detective in charge of the case said this during the press conference where the new sketch was released goading the killer Dur directly to the killer who may be in this room We believe you are hiding in plain sight. For more than two years, you never thought we would shift gears to a different investigative strategy, but we have. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. We know that this is about power to you. And you want to know what we know and one day, you will. Had 15 leads. The question to you. Probably him. Jeez. What will those Why closest to you think of? Closer at him, even if they, they find out that suspect. you brutally murdered two little Hello? girls. Hello, what was that? The question to you. What will those closest to you think of? They find out that Hi babe. What? You look amazing. I'm getting ready to record this. I love you so much, honey. I do too. Hi, Chad. Uh Jay Rod says hi. Only a coward would do I such a thing. What babe? I said that's because Jay Rod is the best. I'm a big question fan. to you. What will those closest to you think of? I don't have my keyboard. They find. Ugh! Please, anyone. Please, anyone get that frame. That frame has popped up a couple times in this video. Really? Find out that you brutally murdered. And you want to know what we know. And one day, you will. Oh, put the vid in half speed. You're so smart. Two children. Only a coward would do it's before this. Murdered two little. What will those closest to you think of? Hi, Fred. A fun. Ah, damn it. Question to you. Sorry, I'm not looking at chat. What will those closest... ...to you think of? Yeah, it is a corrupted frame. It is an error. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. I didn't know if... Uh, maybe he was being cheeky. They find out that you brutally murdered two little Someone girls. Someone tripped over the camera cable, yeah. Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done. Or at the very least, they know because of how different you are since the murders. Sorry, pardon. I just definitely had a really gross belch. I don't know if it got picked up on the mic or not because it was quiet, but it made a disgusting sound. We try so hard to understand how a person could do something like this 
to two, child, to two children. Wait. And I recently watched a movie called The Shack. Yeah, okay. Where is it? And there's also a book that talks so well about evil, about death, and about eternity to the murderer. I believe you have just a little bit of a conscience left. Mustache. It's okay. It's very crooked. It's much fuller on this side than this side. And I can assure you that how you left them in that woods is not. I'm, I'm hypercritical of It's not what hair. they're experiencing today. It was clear that though publicly, it seemed that little had been done to solve the case, it was still being investigated thoroughly, and the police believed they were close to solving the crime. There have been a number of people who have been suspected of killing Abby and Libby over the years, and even more theories about the case have been circulated online, but we will only be covering the publicized leads from the police, as again, we are not in the business of slandering the innocent people while LARPing as investigators. One of the first and most notable persons Anthony of interest Shad. in the New murders was the Ron land. Logan. Ron was on. a resident of Delphi, and the girls' okay. bodies were actually found on his property. Ron was 77 years old when the girls had been killed, but two of his ex-girlfriends came forward after the murder to state that he was an extremely violent person who had threatened to kill them multiple times over. One of them stated that should they ever be killed or go missing, it was Ron who probably did it. Outside of his ex-girlfriends, 15 other residents of Delphi submitted credible tips about him and believed he had been behind the crime. The following is an excerpt from the FBI search warrant that was issued for Ron's home after the murders. Logan's physical build is consistent with that of the male suspect videoed by Libby German on the Monon High Bridge Trail. Logan owns farmland and cares for large farm animals. Logan appears to be in good physical condition. Logan has been interviewed several times. His voice is not inconsistent with that of the person in the video. On February 14th, 2017, the same day the girls' bodies were found, at approximately 9.20 a.m. prior to the discovery of their bodies, Logan contacted his cousin. Logan asked him to tell the police that they had come to Logan's home between 2 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. the day before to pick Logan up. Logan further told them to say that he drove him to an aquarium store in Lafayette, Indiana. Logan told them to say they returned home to Logan's home between 5 and 5.30 p.m. On March 6, 2017, during an interview with a lead investigation official, Logan said he was picked up around 3 and taken straight to the aquarium store in Lafayette. These statements were found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive What a yarnaholic. Thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate 12, it very much. Logan's cousin explained in an interview with an investigator that Logan called him on the morning of February 14th and asked him to provide an alibi for Logan's drive to the aquarium in Lafayette. This phone call was made prior to the discovery of Libby and Abby's deceased bodies. Based on investigators' experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability and knowledge of the crime. Later on in the search warrant, it goes on to state that an analysis of Logan's cell phone data revealed a call was placed using Logan's cell phone. He was in or around his property at 209 the day of the murder. Initial exam of this analysis indicates Logan's phone was in the Delphi area in the area of the Monon High Bridge. Later, Logan received a text message on his phone at 7.56 p.m. and 10.56 p.m. And initial exam of this indicates his phone was likely outside of his residence and in proximity to where Libby and Abby's bodies were found. As damning as the evidence oh, seems shit. to be against Logan, he had a seemingly reasonable explanation as to why he asked his cousin to lie on his behalf. Logan had gone to the aquarium store in Lafayette and could provide a receipt for the time he had been there as an alibi. However, he had driven himself there despite not being legally allowed to drive. He didn't want to admit guilt for breaking his probation and be sent to jail, so he asked his cousin to vouch for him with the hopes that the receipt would be enough evidence for him to remove him from suspicion. 
Though the cell phone data placed Logan close to the scene of the crime, that could also be explained by the minimal cell phone tower coverage in the area, unlike in bigger cities where cell phone towers can be used to find exactly where a person was at certain times. Because the towers covered such a wide swath of land, Ron could have easily been in his home, away from the murder scene at the times where his cell phone was pinged. In 2022, Ron died at the age of 82 years old, and the lead investigators do not believe he took part in the crime. In September Holy of 2017, shit. after the murder of Abby and Libby, Daniel J. Nations was arrested in Woodland Park, Colorado, and charged with threatening strangers on a trail with a hatchet. Given that the cause of death for the girls has never been released, many thought that a man, resembling the sketch, on a trail with a weapon was too similar to be a coincidence. He had a long history of indecent acts, which landed him on the sex offenders registry. In 2007, he was convicted of indecent like exposure in South sick. Carolina. Following that, in 2015, he was caught pleasuring himself in a woman's restroom while looking at women through the stall doors and was once again arrested. Ooh. He failed to appear it in court like after, and a warrant was issued for his arrest, help. which would only occur after he was arrested on suspicion of domestic battery for punching his wife in the nose in front of their children. He lived about two hours away from Delphi, when the murders occurred, but he would go on to say he never visited and was only made aware of the murders when he was already in jail, and inmates accused him of killing the girls. Nations complied with the investigation, providing his own DNA in the hopes that it would exclude him from suspicion. In an article with the Gazette, Nations states he was just as big of a victim in this crime as Libby and Abby as he had been falsely accused by the media and press Don't know about all because that, he hadn't been threatening anyone with a hatchet at Woodland Park. He had been threatening them with his fists and just so happened to be holding a hatchet. He denied that he resembled the composite sketch of the initial suspect at all and stated that it was because of the suspicion around this case that his life was in shambles, which is not quite true, as he had been arrested for domestic battery and was a sex offender. Though he has not been cleared of suspicion fully, the investigation into nations this led nice to a dead end, a lot of and the state police superintendent it, yeah. stated that he was not a person that they cared a whole lot about at that point in time. Nations has stated he looks forward to when the killer will be caught for these murders, not because Libby and Abby will get justice, but because it will finally clear his good name. Shortly after, the police stated that another suspect of the murders was a man by the name of Paul Etter. Paul was a 55-year-old man old who one? had a history of the violence and assaults. His family's farm was roughly eight miles away from the Monon High Bridge, and in 2019, Etter kidnapped and sexually assaulted a 26-year-old woman who had pulled into his driveway after getting a flat tire. According to the woman, Jesus. Etter approached her after she pulled in and asked her if she needed any help. At once, she felt unsafe and declined his offer, choosing to drive a little ways down the road until she was at her friend's house. Unbeknownst to her, he had gotten into his car and followed her. When she got out of her vehicle, he abducted her, took her back to his family's home, and sexually assaulted her. He then decided to take her back to her car. The woman immediately reported what had happened to the police, and Edder went on the run while posting to Facebook, about how his mind wasn't right and he had done bad things. He was able to avoid capture for five days, stealing cars and hiding out in the town. But on June 27th, the cops caught up with him and in a standoff with the police, he ended up taking his own life. Oh, no. It was later publicized that the police had been tipped off that Edder could have taken part in the murder of Libby and Abby, given how close his family's farm was to the crime scene and his sexual depravity. However, while the police stated he was a big person of interest who they needed to rule out, it's clear that he is no longer considered such. Thomas Bruce was also considered a suspect of the murders, given his similar appearance Kevin to Klein. the initially okay. released police sketch of the killer. Bruce had previously been a pastor, but had been charged with the killing of one woman and sexually assaulting others after holding them at gunpoint in the back of a religious supply shop. The attack was done in broad daylight, How fucking which was shocking. not dissimilar it's almost as if to what had happened with Libby into and Abby. Most chastity. notably, he had been wearing a flat cap and a blue jacket Fuck. similar almost to the as one if when you that eyewitnesses said the bridge chastity, guy had been wearing. But, uh, much like the others, this lead didn't appear to pan out. To However, terrible, terrible he remains things. in prison after being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and multiple other heinous crimes have been linked to him since. Charles Eldridge Shit. was also suspected of being the killer 
after he was arrested in 2019 on charges of child molestation and child solicitation, mostly based on how closely he resembled oh, no, the composite sketch. Right? That said, later that really year, the back. investigation changed course immediately, and the new sketch was released, mm -hmm. which led to Charles being looked over entirely. Other people were named I as persons of interest but it wasn't until 2021 chastity. that the police came forward with a new suspect. One who seemed to know Without a the lot about the crime of it ever that had not been made for you. public. On December 6, 2021, thing. the public you information I mean? officer with the Indiana State Police announced that the man behind the online persona, Anthony underscore Shots, was the prime suspect in the murders. According to the police, the person behind the profile was one of the last people to interact with Libby before her death. And though it seems the Snapchat logs have not been turned over to the police by the company, the fact that this account spoke to her shortly before the girls were killed and the profile is not linked to anyone in the Delphi area is more than suspicious. The account was only active from 2016 to 17 and used photos of a male model to talk to the girls. Moreover, a man behind oh, the account was, was found to be priest, Keegan like Anthony Klein, priest. who resided in Peru, Indiana, which is My just bad. a 40 minute drive away from Delphi. Klein had been uh, interviewed at, by the Indiana at State any rate, Police. Just there's still there's still the chastity for an entirely different there's crime still an ex surrounding expectation the of account. like a Prior level of chastity, interview, right? The police raided his home like, and there's found still over 100 photos and videos like, of underage girls that he had solicited them. using the Anthony Shots Instagram, Kick, and Snapchat. Because but they he hadn't every been opportunity connected to the Delphi case until 2020 Jesus when the Indiana State Police interviewed him. According to chat logs with other girls from the account, Klein would tell people that he was supposed to meet Libby prior to her death, but she, quote, never showed up, which asks the question, oh, did the girls go to Monon High Bridge with the plan okay, to meet Anthony, girl. thinking he was a cute boy who was supposedly a little bit older than them, only to be attacked by Keegan? The Anthony Schatz account and Keegan had gotten onto police radar only Depends six days on after the murders, I guess. when another I like minor who had been talking to the fake account told Keegan that he should come over the Nobody next day to hang out has that as her parents right. wouldn't it's be home. She was appalling. too young and naive to Jesus know that she was cool being guy. preyed on and believed that, quote, Anthony time. Schatz was someone who wasn't going to take advantage of her. She gave Keegan her address, which he then looked up on multiple of his personal electronic devices, while also Googling her parents' Facebook accounts. The next day, when she got off the bus from school, she saw a man wearing a ski mask looking into her bedroom window. This man physically did not match who she thought Anthony was, and when he realized Keegan? he had been okay. spotted, he ran off. The girl and her parents called the police, and that is when the Anthony Schatz account became known as she informed them he had gotten her address the day prior. In five days' time, the police were able to track the account back down to Klein and his father's home and raided the domicile, where they found the huge cache of child abuse images. Keegan maintained that he wasn't the man who was stalking outside the girl's home, but him talking to her shortly before, looking up her address and checking her parents' social media account says otherwise. He was booked in 2020 for his possession of child pornography and is still currently in jail, facing 30 charges surrounding that. Wow, there's Keegan a lot of talent here, so to speak. that he had anything to do with the murders and says that he doesn't recall talking to Libby at any point. He also stated that he feels as if he is being personally attacked and persecuted by the police over the girl's murder, like which I is unfair feel... because he is just a pedophile who was caught with over a hundred images of children he solicited over social media, and that it's very different. The Murder Sheet podcast was able to get the transcript I, I of an like interview a that was conducted between here. the police and Keegan. The entire document is over a hundred pages long, and if you would like to read it, I will leave a link to it in the description down below. In the interview, Keegan tried to state that all the images they found weren't technically illegal, as they were from when he was a minor. A direct quote is, I, like I told them, I can't remember her name. She was just like the, yeah, I don't know, there's all kinds the of rape division. in the Amish um, community. All those old videos from all when I was underage. The interviewer in the then community. states, well, I want to make it clear, too, that we not only it's have like watched her interviews, but we've personally well gone through secret. each device. 
We've watched the videos, we've seen the pictures, and I can tell you that you were not underage at the time. At various times in the interview, Keegan tries to maintain that he never used fake accounts under fake names to solicit or share porn. But when pressed as to who would have access to his phone and computer to spend countless hours doing as much, he was at a loss. Friends who he stayed with were brought up as well as his father, but Keegan maintained that they wouldn't have been able to access his phone without him knowing, which he seemingly didn't realize meant that he was the only person who could have received the child porn. As the interrogation went on, the interviewer slowly revealed just how obvious it was that Keegan or his father were the only two men who could be behind the accounts, given that every false account opened led back to their shared home and Keegan's own emails, but he continued to deny responsibility, saying he was definitely a catfish and talked to girls, but didn't go as far as they said he did. It wasn't until page 129 that the investigators brought up Libby and Abby. They asked Keegan why he repeatedly searched Google in the days following the murder about the case, to which Keegan said he was just casually interested in seeing what had happened as a concerned citizen. When asked why he wasn't concerned because Liberty was someone he was talking to, he said he remembered having talked to her because he was talking to so many other young girls at the time. The entire transcript will be available in the description box down below along with a link to the Murder Sheet podcast, as they have gone over this case in incredible detail. As of now, Keegan has still not been charged with the murders, and there is still a possibility that he or his father had nothing to do with the crime, outside of preying on Liberty Online. But according to those closest to this case, it is on the precipice of being solved. If you have interacted with the Anthony Schatz account or know any information, I feel like please if my send name a tip was Liberty, to the I'd Indiana go State by Police Bert. or the <laughs> FBI. Links to do so are in the description box down below. Is that too Abby and Libby quirky, deserve to rest in peace. Not like other and their girls. killer needs to be put away. Thank you to established titles for the support, and thank you for watching the video. If you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please leave them down in the comments or email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. Have a great day, Luther? and remember to stay safe. The bear? Okay, y'all. Um... I won't be around tomorrow. It's Canada Day. Uh, when so the internet was developed, with friends. people often waxed. Also, uh, I just haven't been streaming on Fridays because we don't get shit for viewership on Fridays. And that's bad for my channel to do streams on days. I, it's bad for the algorithm or whatever. Like, I don't show up on suggested in the bottom left as much when um, my averages are low, if that makes sense. Um... Anyway, I am so thankful for you guys for hanging out with me tonight. Uh, I know that I wasn't as much fun as I normally am. And I know uh, that it kind of was just like a shitty mood around here. I'm really sorry. Uh, thank you for just sitting in it with me. You guys are really great. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, and please never feel obligated to do that when, you know... It's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When, like, when I'm, when I'm being shitty, please don't feel obligated to stick around. I understand that it's not fun to be around. Uh, real quick shout out to all of my patrons. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for supporting monetarily. Uh, to Quinn, Laura, Katie, and Big Wolf Paws, I appreciate it so much. I'm going to be moving my, um, like, support my patr patronage feature over to Kofi. Um, I'm still trying to really figure out how to set up the shop and how I want that to be done. Um, and I'm really sorry that it hasn't been done yet. Uh, I think that next Friday is probably the day that I will spend like all day doing stuff like that. Um, please definitely, if you're new here, uh, hit that follow. If you have a uh, Twitch Prime sub lying around, I would love to take it off your hands. No pressure, obviously, if you want to see what other talents out there. Um, definitely feel free to join the discord. We want to hear from you. It's been kind of quiet there lately. It would be nice to get some new, new blood in. Uh, and I feel like we could, uh, have just all the time we could be talking about, um, true crime or mysteries on the internet or ghost videos or, uh, whatever. And we have some crochet channels there as well. Uh, there's some really fun patterns in there. Um, and then follow me on 
Twitter if you feel like it. But most of the time, oh, Steve, thank you so much for the sub. I appreciate it a whole lot. Thank you. Steve Jenkins, 42 Sparkler. Since I asked, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It helps. It helps. Every single one counts and helps so much. I uh, used to be able to pay all my bills, and now I can't. So <laughs> each and every one of these subs is mwah, it's perfect. I appreciate it. Um, most of the time lately I've been tweeting about how the United States is falling the fuck apart. Uh, so if that's annoying to you, probably don't follow me there. But if you are obnoxiously leftist or like you don't even really have to be that leftist to understand that things are falling the fuck apart, that there is actually a judicial coup happening in the Supreme Court right now. Um, but anyway, I, I bitch about that a lot and I say really mean things to Republicans a lot. I'm working on it. I'm trying to be a better person and not do that. But for right now... I can't help myself. Uh, I think that that's everything that I have uh, for tonight. So everybody, thank you for hanging out. I will see you on Monday. Um, we might, I mean, like super don't count on it, but we might try to do a bonus stream on Saturday since I've been gone all week. And um, it's just been, it's been nice to have your company tonight. So, um, okay. I love you guys a billion jillion and I will see you Monday. Steve Jenkins 42 Sparkler.